Hello, everyone, and welcome to the reactive performance testing session. Um, so when I think about performance and what it looks like in the real life, as I was preparing for this session, I was really thinking a lot about pipes <laughs> and about performance being measuring the capacity, the pressure the pipe can sustain, and the durability of it. So there is going to be some, some examples of pipes during this talk. Hello, I am Lilit Yenokin. I am director of engineering at a Silicon Valley startup called Pivotus. It's a financial technology startup. We build apps for banks, and you will see a bit of that. We were actually successfully acquired this Monday by a company called Kony, and the brand Pivotus is no longer there, but for the sake of presentation, there is. Um, I'm co-founder of anitab.org. It's an organization that empowers women and girls to pursue careers in technology. It's uh, for the Silicon Valley chapter. Um, as we see in the representation here in this room, we need more of more women and more girls. <laughs> um, so I've, I'm an alumni of Netflix and Microsoft, and in those companies, we really care a lot about scalability and about performance. And if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, it's Elian Okian. So the pictures, fine pictures up here on the top, you see part of the performance and test automation team, part of my team. Uh, and the one below was our, basically the entire Pivot Test headquarters team that part of it uh, went to Cody. So basically what it is that we're trying to measure, right? We're trying to see the capacity of the pipe in the, essentially, if that's the inflow of water or liquid or whatever it is that's going through, we're trying to measure what it is that, how much capacity can we sustain and how much pressure can those pipes sustain. So in this session, we are going to talk a little, uh, a lot about like when do you use performance testing? Why should you care? And I'll show you why. <laughs> and what are the things that uh, you should keep on in mind when you're doing that? Um, and we'll talk a bit about demonstration on the Pivotus's use case, how we did it. Some takeaways might be applicable to your application and your use case. So uh, just wanted to give you a bit of overview of like what we did, what, how we operated. Um, it's a very distributed team, uh, headquartered in San Francisco, two more locations in California. We had remote employees in Texas, in um, Pittsburgh, in New Jersey, and my geography is a bit off there. <laughs> also in uh, Peru and uh, Argentina, as well as Armenia. And across five different time zones and three different continents, we were able to, I, I had um, a team member in each, each of those locations and we were able to operate productively. So basically, uh, this is the application. So this is a screenshot of what the app looks like on the Apple Store today, which is um, we are providing the interface for bank, banks to better engage with their customers. What it is is that you are able to, as a, basically as a customer of a bank, you're able to choose a personal agent, a financial advisor or, um, that's dedicated to you and they are accessible at all times. And you can browse to profiles and select one that you like. Um, and as a bank, you have the first level agents who are engaging with customers. One agent can support hundreds and thousands of customers. You have different hierarchies managers of those agents, um, organizational units, administrators that can see everything. And uh, things get complicated like um, as you have like more and more data on upper levels you have, you're dealing with more data. For example, if you're an individual agent, you can see your 500 customers. If you're a manager, you can see all the customers of all of your um, employees and all of their conversations with gets to be a lot. So we got uh, some really interesting press when this was announced. Uh, we were called uh, 
a Tinder of banking. <laughs> because you can swipe two profiles, you can select the one you like, and if it doesn't work out, you can go back and swipe again and select the agent that you really like. So, more Tinder <laughs> references. Um, and uh, I think a question might come up, was this appropriate? Was this okay for the personal agents in the banks? Yes, with one exception. <laughs> Uh, but we build a machine learning system that is able to filter through some um, inappropriate content. So um, a bit more of basically just to showcase what is the complexity of the system. Essentially, it consists of three parts. First is the bank agent portal, where the bank agent can see all their uh, customers, view all their conversations, in different levels of hierarchies, like the managers can see more. Um, and this is a React-based system, JavaScript. Um, and then we have the customer apps. So customer apps are both uh, Android and iOS, uh, built with React Native. And then what's more important for the sake of today's conversation is our reactive microservices. We have eight of them, and essentially, they needed to scale. So um, the prototype of this application was developed before, and it worked great. As the, but as the like, number of um, customers increased, it would stop loading, and it just completely failed. So there was a need to reorganize and have a more profound approach, like using Akka and Lagom and um, reactive approach to, to re-architect this. So, and then the question that we ask ourselves, and I think the question that any engineering organization should ask themselves is like when you're designing the system, before you even start is, what is the amount of load that your system is supposed to support, right? How much, how many users, how many conversations in those units will be different from one application to another? It might be number of queries, but for us it was two things, number of users and number of conversations. And um, how do you come up with those numbers? So what we will do is we will define the performance testing and clarify a little bit about the different varieties of it and how the terms get overused, discuss the metrics that we have used, talk about um, how is UI different from microservices and um, the performance testing part of them, and showcase some of the lessons that we learned that you might want to avoid. So this is not a pipe, but this is another way of like, you have a dam. I'm thinking about this as well as like, also the, the comprehension and the performance of the system. So you have this, in, and if you turn it on at the full capacity, how much fluid can handle before it collapses? That's the essentially defining the load or defining the performance of this object. So why should you care? Um, because it saves money, right? If you write a performance system, it means that your, um, your system it can handle more queries and you do not need to scale up as fast. Sure, we can put auto-scaling and we can scale up number of instances and then you're going to get um, a bill from the cloud provider, be that AWS or uh, Azure or the Google Cloud, that's not going to look nice. So it's important to, um, to make sure that the system is performant. The more perf performant it is, the more efficient it is. Except for the, as an engineer, we love to right effective systems, it also, there is a very good case from the business side and for in, any size of organization, why this is critical and why this is important. I, I gave my punchline already. <laughs> so let's talk about defining the performance tests and performance testing. 
So it's performance testing can basically refer, refers to lots of things, right? And I wanted to showcase three different examples, the load testing, stress testing, and endurance testing. So what is the load testing? A load testing is um, definition and basically how much load can your system sustain in the normal use case before it starts to throw errors, before it starts to produce errors. What is that normal amount of load? So in the pipe analogy, what is the full capacity before it starts to throw any leaks or before it, anything else happens? The stress test is pushing your system beyond its design limits, beyond what the load test can accomplish, and really stressing it and seeing what happens. Is it able to gracefully recover after the load comes down? Is it able to, um, to how long can it sustain it? And if it's able to recover, how long that does it take? So, for stress test, I think it's the pressure of the pipes, like it's the amount of pressure it can sustain before it just collapses. And the endurance test is the durability. So we have done the, we have established the load, and endurance means that we're doing the load test in a long run. So it can be number of hours, it can be even number of days. And your system can be super performant for the short span, for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but when you turn this on for hours, uh, you might run out of memory, you might run out of CPU, or just it might become no longer responsive, and um, that also needs to be measured. And for the sake of pipes, <laughs> this is the, in the terms of pipes, this is the basically the durability of, the, of those, when it is that it um, wears down or it's starting the leaks. So for the sake of this discussion, we're gonna mostly be talking about the load tests. So um, what do we need to do before we start, right? We need to define basically how much load is it that we want to handle? Because every system has its capacities, or even, in, even when you're basically starting a startup, you don't want to design it to handle a billion users because you are not gonna get a billion users at the same time, so, but you want to define what it is that you're gonna be tracking. And then, of course, the define and implement the set test scenarios, and uh, after you have implemented, and those are well defined, establish the high water marks. So high water marks are these breaking points when the load test has run and it's at its full capacity before it starts throwing, the system starts throwing any of the 400 or 500 errors, that is the high water mark. So and of course, monitoring the results, release after release and making sure that there is no performance degradation is an ongoing task and an ongoing goal. So if you ha already have um, a data, basically a production data in the system, that's awesome, right? That's gonna serve you as the basis of what it is that you're gonna be optimizing for. Um, in our case, we didn't really have that luxury. We had the prototype that really broke down very quickly and we needed to come up with the data sort of on the fly. So first approach, first most intuitive approach is to go and ask your customers, how many users do you think you will have? Sure, they will give you the number for the users because they know how many agents they want to have and how many customers they want to onboard to this new system. And um, the fourth one here is the agent to customer ratio. It can be sort of derived from this. Um, it's basically the division of those two numbers. But the one that we had most um, surprises with is the messages per day. So when we asked our clients, how many messages do you think the customers and agents will be exchanging per day? They were far too optimistic. They thought it will be in tens of thousands, in hundreds of thousands, but then when we enabled the system, it was in like hundreds or low thousands. 
so it wasn't as quickly and the customers were not asking their agents, how do I refinance my loan and get a mortgage? It was like um, much more, much simpler queries and fewer messages exchanged. But uh, basically we want to come up with these numbers before we start designing the performance tests and I can make a case before we really start to implementing the logic or during the implementation of the microservices. So we came up with a benchmark that was just used for the development of the tests. It's not, nothing real. And then the next thing was the low load. So low load is like the pessimistic case. I have fewer customers, let's say three clients. Each one of them is a bank in our case. And for each one of them, we have 100 agents, 1,000 customers, and a million messages per day. And then a target load that was um, the realistic load that we really wanted to strive against, strive for. And then, of course, there are going to be like higher targets as you make more progress, but you don't have to plan for it right away. So next, I'm going to focus about on the metrics that we used and bring up some, some of those metrics that will be applicable in your use cases to see if that those are gonna be interesting for you or not. So by no means I am advertising or representing any of those tools, but this is the, num the, the tools that we used. Um, and you do not need all of them. You can take a subset, a much smaller subset, and if you're looking at this, you might even question why did we need both Sumo and Datadog and Grafana. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So the next question, of course, is like, where do you run your performance test, right? Ideally, you have your production cluster and you run it right on your production cluster. But if you have real users, that might impact them, right? <laughs> you might stress test your system and it that might not recover. So what do you do? So basically come up with a clone or a copy of the production cluster that is the same size, the same number of instances as the production cluster. And it can really predict what the performance of your production code is gonna be look like. We use AWS, but this can be this is cloud agnostic, of course, can be any of those, can be your own data center or machine. So next, a few um, highlights of each of how we used each of those tools. Um, so test rail is a really, it's, it's a really cool tool. It's basically for creating test cases, logging the steps, organizing test runs, organizing test, ca test categories, um, and uh, also tracking results. So, after each test run, you can create a, a very nice test rail report. Um, that's what we use for the functional automation, not so much on the performance side. This is just a screenshot of like part of the uh, performance test suite. It can be a simple Google Doc. It can be a, a spreadsheet as well. This is just a tool we chose. And it was one of the, I think, one of the great investments and decisions. The next one you all know, of course, is Jenkins. <laughs> so again, it can be any continuous integration system. We actually don't use Jenkins for our main, uh, basically, repositories for our backend or frontend repos. We use CircleCI. Uh, but for it, because CircleCI is hosted, it's easier to operate, and it's much more mobile friendly. Um, but for performance tests, actually, we chose to use Jenkins. And the big reason behind, behind that decision is that we wanted the jobs to be very configurable because we aren't the only consumers of these jobs and we want to be able to specify different delays and different number of, basically, different number of threads and uh, to provide these tools also to our partner teams like the software reliability engineers to run this at any time and diagnose anything on the system. So, uh, and we chose to host the Jenkins also on our, our basically instance on AWS that's, that's running the performance tests. 
And um, single master slave configuration, I think nothing too complicated here. We also chose to recycle the results like to keep the rolling um, results for the last 90 days. So next thing is JMeter. Um, JMeter is used to run the load tests. It can simulate the target load uh, and returns the statistics about the performance. So JMeter is really, it's a good tool. You can also host it. And uh, one, one thing to keep in mind about JMeter is that if you really want to simulate lots of load, one instance of JMeter is just not going to be enough. You might need multiple. So next is the combination. Those are actually two tools, but a combination of InfluxDB and Grafana, where InfluxDB is a time series database, and we stored our performance testing uh, results, and Grafana is used to visualize those reports. Grafana is useful because you can specify a time range, you can attach it to the reports, and it's really good visual indication if something goes wrong. And if you choose to have a dashboard in the middle of office with the health of the system, Grafana is really good also to, to show the progress over time. Um, so yeah, and it can keep as much data as you need. So, and then Sumo Logic. So Sumo Logic is used for tracking the performance of the system or just any system. And what we use Sumo for is not only for our performance cluster, but also our production cluster, our development and test clusters as well. And this was a really good central place for people who do not look at the performance results every day or day by day to go and basically get this data. And the top part is more about the overall performance of the system. And what we care more about in the scope of performance is like when we simulated this much load, how did it look, which is on this bottom left corner here. And of course, you can see like number of requests, number of passing requests, failures, as well as uh, see the breakdown. And actually, this was another really good data source for us to, to architect our performance tests, which is like looking at the production cluster, seeing how many of each type of requests happened, and then modeling our tests after those. So the next tool is Datadog. It's for systems metric monitoring, and you can see the CPU and memory usage pretty well, and you can also specify any time and date range. Um, and uh, it's uh, we we were actually we were actually looking to integrate all of this in Sumo Logic, but it's not very intuitive, and we chose to basically do the same date range for Datadog and for Grafana and attach it to all of the test results. So the last thing is Atlassian and Confluence. It's just for logging the results and you can have like, we generated all these reports with each of the runs um, and extracted those to be, to be also, if customers ask for any of those, this was a very good place to start, just seeing how, how the, system performed under the expected load for the last uh, last version and also for the build before or the version before. So basically from this, from all of these tools, I think the starter would be JMeter with Jenkins and InfluxDB and Grafana or any other variation of this. It's basically you need a tool to run the test some place that it will execute and record the results and something to visualize it with. So let's talk about basically what is, um, how is this different for UI versus monolith versus microservices or reactive microservices. So for the monolithic application, you can basically qualify and look at the system performance as a whole, right? For microservices, you can break down and each test each microservice in the separation. That's what we've done. But it is also very important to keep in mind to 
to see how those play together because all the services integrate with one another. And for the UI, it's a very different set of tests, but it is very, very important to also keep in mind that you want to performance test the UI and make sure that under the high load, let's say if you're using the browser client, you're still able to load. If you're requesting for a lot of data that it's able to load, the browser doesn't hang, it doesn't crash. If you have a mobile application, Android or iOS application, then it, um, it's not memory constraint, memory, uh, too memory intensive and um, it's not very slow. And one, one way to do this actually, what we found um, was a good scenario is when we run the endurance test, which is this long 10 hour stretch of tests, we did perform the UI um, performance testing at that time to see how did the UI, will, is the UI gonna be impacted when the system is under load? And of course, for basically the classical distributed systems are right, you have um, different, you have essentially many clusters of the same thing versus reactive, it's the four pillars, responsive, resilient, elastic, and message driven. So it's a different approach <laughs> and make sure to basically address uh, reactive if you're using it. So I'm gonna focus a bit on the, like, the interesting discoveries and the lessons that we've learned during this effort, during this one year of running performance tests. So what we did initially is we run our results, we run our tests on one pod, which is one, one instance of each of the services. And we came up with the high watermarks or basically we found the number of threads, let's say for the first one, send a message from customer to agent. We came, with num came up with number of threads and uh, what is gonna be the RPS, the request per second, maximum re request per second before it starts throwing errors. And for the first one, for example, we came up with 17. And then what we did was we scaled up from one instance to three. And our assumption, was that this is gonna scale just linearly, right? If you scale the number of instances three times, then the RPS should be three times higher. But it ended up not being the case. Actually, some of the, some of the APIs performed decent, while others, the performance degraded, you can see they are in red. So actually, this was due to two different reasons. One was the database was getting very full and needed a reset, it was slowing things down. And the second one was there was a web socket handling issue uh, with multiple instances of services that only occurred once we upgraded the number of instances. And this ended up being something that we, our engineering team worked on number of sprints to address this and to be able to scale, uh, scale up without really impacting the performance rather than improving the performance. So the second one was um, basically more of a stress test scenario. We ran the stress test and we noticed that in 24 hours, the system was not still recovering. It was still in a bad state and the disaster recovery didn't happen properly. So the reason was incorrect configuration of the recovery mode. And this is one of the tests that we make sure to do with every release, to make sure that we do not degrade. So the third example, I wanted to set the, basically give you a bit of background. So each of the agents can send a mass message. A mass message means that all of the customers of the particular agent are gonna get it. And uh, this can be, as, as we saw previously, it can be a thousand customers, it can be a 10,000 customers. So when we, when we run the test, we actually saw that like when we were blasting this message to all the customers, it wasn't being delivered on time. It was timing out, we ran into a ton of issues. So instead the solution was to sequence this, introduce a minor lag when you're de delivering to everyone. 
And this is sort of counterintuitive because you build, build up to scale. At the same time, you find out that actually a better performance is if you sequence things rather than if you do everything in parallel. So the fourth one is um, basically when we're running the, per the performance test, we saw that we, yeah, we use a basically read size database and write size database and a lot goes in between, in between that. And when we were creating a user and when that user was trying to log in, we saw that the user wasn't created. And essentially, because of the design, it was taking up to three seconds for the user to appear in the system. The same thing happened actually, a similar thing happened when you're sending a message and when, when you expect to receive it, it also takes a number of seconds to get there. This is also uh, something to keep in mind, is like this is because of the design of our system. This design cannot handle really uh, quick delivery, but is this gonna impact our end user? Probably not. This is something to keep in mind when we're writing our performance tests. And then lastly, I want to call out that the performance can degrade over time. It is really, really critical. I want to stress this as much as I can to run the performance test with every release, with each and every release, because if, because of a highly integrated system and all the services talking together and all of the new features that are being built on, we saw that release after release, the RPS was going down, and we decided that we are going to run this test, the load test, with each, each and every release. So, basically, my key takeaways are that this, these are all the examples, and my takeaways for you <laughs> is that uh, before you commit to building the, the system, Define what it is, what is your success criteria. Define how much load it is that you want your system to sustain before you start scaling up. And then start measuring the performance early on with the early iterations of your services. You don't really have to have UI built on top of it. You can just have your JMeter scripts or you can simulate the same thing with Akka, right? And do this, start doing this iteratively and start doing this early on. And um, basically question the obvious. <laughs> the scaling up number of pods doesn't really mean that you're gonna get better performance. As you saw in my examples, it got actually worse. So question the obvious, make sure to do the diligence and run those tests. And also measure the performance with every release, monitor and alert if something goes wrong. And um, so I think one of the one of the advantages of like being so diligent in logging everything, one of the reasons for us is because it's a regulated industry, we have to have logs of everything. <laughs> and the other reason is that going back, we can compare release after release, what was the result, and you can see it on Confluence. <laughs> so that's all I had. If you have any questions, please ask at the microphone. I don't think it's on. Okay, so the question is, what was the size of the team that achieved this work? So this was done by two engineers. Uh, two, two, over the course of this time, uh, specifically focused on the performance um, and running those, those tests and building the tools. How do you run your scenarios? Uh, do you run, um, if you have a scenario for an agent, do you run them uh, one by one, or do you run like multiple scenarios at the same time or interlaced? And uh, like, how do you keep track uh, to make sure that the results, uh, that you can do a follow-up and mm -hmm. uh, that it's not just a whole bunch of things happening at the same time and you can draw any conclusions? 
that's a great question, actually. Thank you. So how do, how do we run the test? Do we just run them ad hoc, or do we run them sequentially? Or do we run multiple scenarios at once? So we have established a set of scenarios that are the regression testing of performance that are run after for each release. So once a release candidate is established, we deploy this on the production system, production uh, performance uh, cluster, that's like production, and we run the reg set of regression tests for that. Uh, so that can be basically one of the approaches is to just stress test one of the APIs, and the other approach is more comprehensive scenarios which are derived based on our data on amplitude and based on our data from Sumo logic of which, which of the uh, requests are being, which of the queries are being run more than the others. So that's, and of course we also do ad hoc testing as well. Let's say if you want to stress test one of these scenarios or if, uh, if SRE team wants to, has made a size change in the JVM and they want to see how is it gonna work, so you can basically run a single single uh, test at once. But the, I think the second part of the question was, do we run sequentially? Yes, we do run sequentially because if you run multiple of this in parallel, then you're gonna impact the results. You're gonna skew the results. All right, looks like no more questions. Um, I'll be around if anyone wants to chat or you have ideas. I would love to hear those. Thank you very much. <laughs>